Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and this is this is our Fourth of July uh, recording here. Yeah, I thought <clears throat> if you're gonna have talk about a scary movie for Fourth of July, Silver Bullet comes to mind. So yeah, maybe we can do one on Halloween, which is when the big climax of Silver Bullet happens. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I got a question. So <laughs> before Silver Bullet, you were an assistant director to Steven Spielberg, right? On like ET. Right. Uh, right. And Twilight Zone, the movie. So what was that experience like? And did Mr. Spielberg teach you anything? That's an interesting question. I had, I, I had known I wanted to be a director. I had been in a graduate program at film, in film school and I didn't have a thesis film I wanted to make. And I thought, okay, well, instead of just hanging out forever here, uh, maybe I could assist directors and learn that way. So I got into the assistant directors training program that's the Directors Guild of America sponsors. And I and I worked as a trainee assistant director on, on Airplane. That was another big hit I worked on. And then I was a second assistant director and I worked uh, for both Spielberg and Coppola and Vim Vendors and Sam Fuller and a lot of really great directors. Joe Dante, your, your audience might know his, his work. Uh, you know, kind of trying to apprentice myself to good directors. And uh, <clears throat> Spielberg was obviously one of the best. And, uh, you know, he taught me a lot. He taught me, uh, you know, I, I think, I think, you know, maybe it's a good time to mention this, that I've, I've written about being a director. I've written a book uh, called Directing Great uh, Television, Inside TV's New Golden Age, just came out a few months back. And uh you know, one of the things I, I write about is how important it is for a director to trust themselves, you know, and that that's really the lesson I, the main lesson I learned from Spielberg, in addition to just observing his great talent, was just how he, and also how Coppola and other great directors I've worked with, they all have distinctive voices and you really got to find your own. You can't really, my view anyway, is, is that I don't really want to mimic other people. I want to learn from them. But the biggest job in directing is really trusting your own instincts. And that's what he did. So, you know, I can't, uh, I will say though, it's funny because uh, Silver Bullet was my first job directing. And uh, I, I did find myself invoking Steven in my imagination at one point because I was trying to figure out how to photograph the climactic last scene, you know, where the werewolf you know, comes into the, yeah. to Marty's house. And, you know, I was just kind of going around and around and around. What would be a dramatic entrance? And uh, I found myself just saying, what would Spielberg do? <laughs> and of course, I didn't call him up and ask him, but I just put myself in his mindset, how I interpreted. And I said, well, he just had the, he just had the where we'll break through the wall, just come through the wall, you know? And it's like, whoa, I hadn't even thought of that. You know, it's like, I think, well, there's an entrance here. There's a window there. There's a, it's like, why not just break down the whole wall? And that, that was, was funny by actually invoking him in my imagination, I came up with a much bolder uh, idea. Uh, and so that's, that's, that's kind of what I, uh, I, I took from my experience with Steven. That's awesome. I love that story. Well, what was the original entrance then? Like, what was the werewolf going to do before that? I think it was just coming through the window or, you okay. know, not. So I tried to figure out a whole kind of way of misdirecting the audience's attention. So what, boy, this was a long time ago. This was almost, uh, <laughs> gosh, it was like 38 years ago. <laughs> it was yeah. this. But I do, it was my first job too. And it was funny too, because uh, the producer was Dino De Laurentiis, who I don't know if your viewers still know how significant of character he was, a figure he was, but he was a big character. I mean, he's a small man in stature, but huge presence. And he had done tons of films. And this was my first job. And he put me with a cameraman, a brilliant cameraman, Armando Nanuzzi, but he didn't speak a word of English. So it was my first job. And I was speaking with a guy who only spoke Italian. Yeah. So we both had kind of poor French skills. So we'd kind of communicate that way. But uh, I was trying to figure out, you know, how to make the entrance most shocking. And I liked, I loved the idea of crashing through the wall. That was a huge yeah. one. But I also had been thinking, I needed to misdirect it. So I needed to position Gary Busey playing Uncle Red, you know, with his back right to where the wall was going to 
cave in and the werewolf was going to come. And so, you know, fans of the movie will remember, you know, we saw the werewolf. We probably got the best view of the view of the werewolf's face up until this point. Yeah, that yeah. one moment where Janie sees him in the window. And so we, we, we've est we established him there on that side of the house. I knew I wanted him to come in from that side of the house. So I had to create a bit of a misdirect. So uh, Uncle Red approaches the window after Janie screams. And, uh, you know, and I also had to figure out a way to justify how the bullet came out of that. It really wasn't scripted. It was scripted. Stephen King had written that he takes the bullet out, but I had to kind of justify why that, how that would happen. Yeah. So he goes all the way to the window. He turns around. He starts to realize, okay, I've been had again by these over-imaginative kids. <laughs> and I thought, I thought by his, his saying his great line, uh, I'm beginning to feel like a horse's ass. <laughs> like I thought that would be a great time to like take out the bullet to, to yeah. dramatize. This is why I've, this shows why I feel like I'm a horse's ass. I, yeah. I melted down my the silver thing and I made this silly bullet. So that way I got the hand, you know, so the bullet's not in the gun, we knew that. But I created a, no, a noise distraction somewhere else. And then I did a, a dolly move so that, uh, we, the, as, as Uncle Red hears the noise, which was coming off camera left from, from, from uh, Gary Busey, who played Uncle Red from his point of view, I did a dolly move moving around to pull, to get closer to his eye line, to suggest to the audience, yes, it's behind us. It's coming out from yeah. another place to take all the attention away from the wall. And then hopefully when the wall crashed and caved in, people were, were surprised. Yeah. So there you go. Uh, I was going to ask, was that line, uh, I heard Gary Busey did a lot of ad-libbing. Did he yeah. add that line? Yeah, Gary was, a, oh, he was a pistol. He, <laughs> he did some great ad-libbing. Yeah. Uh, I, I can't even tell you, but you, you, you fans of the movie will remember it. Jumping, G has to focus, some, something like some <laughs> long collection of, uh, yeah. says, you know, it was all him. And, uh, and by the way, Stephen King was really uh, not very present during it, but he was really open and collaborative. I mean, I met him during prep. You know, uh, you guys may, may or may not know, you know, there really was no book that Silver Bullet was based on. It was based on a calendar, Cycle of the Werewolf. It was just okay. like, you know, every month in Tarker's Mills, this is happens. Well, you know, so he kind of, De Laurentiis was, had made a lot of, uh, Stephen King movies, Firestarter, Cat's Eye, and other things. And he'd go on to make more. And so he, he optioned the, the calendar <laughs> and uh, Stephen <laughs> kind of wrote this script. Yeah. And uh, at, there was one scene that, uh, and Stephen was very open to my notes. I gave him a few and he incorporated them. Here I am a first time director, but he, he liked my take on the material. And I, add, I, I rehearsed a scene and I really expanded it from what Stephen had written. And it was the scene where um, Uncle Red makes his first appearance and he's having, he's playing with Marty. They're playing uh, some game checkers or something or other. I forget what they're playing. And uh, his, his sister watches them playing and he, he starts to swear and the sister sends Marty upstairs and they get into a little bit of an argument. But I really wanted to flesh that out because I, I think the reason I got the job and I certainly why Stephen and I bonded was I had a whole take on what was really going on in this story. And I, and I, I thought it was really interesting that uh, Marty was in a wheelchair, that he was disabled. And I started to really think of the, that the, the overall subtext of the movie, what was really going on and beneath the surface for me was how do characters deal with disability? Because Marty wasn't the only one who had a disability. He had the most obvious one. But other characters did too. Uh, you know, the, and, and most pronounced was uh, the Reverend. He had, I, I said, okay, how do you become a werewolf? Okay, this is getting in kind of metaphorical <laughs> stuff. But it's like, how do you become a monster? And I took the idea like, well, you become a monster if you can't accept your own wounds. If you can't really look at your imperfections or the things that give you, you know, pain or wo have wounded you, if you deny them, it comes back in much fuller force. So I started to think of the Reverend as 
a character who had this view of himself, he had to be, you know, puritanically perfect. And if he had sexual anything, it's like, no, 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 no. So he's deeply repressed and then he becomes a monster. And then I thought, well, Uncle Red has his own disability. He can't face his life. He can't face, he's an alcoholic. So he's, he's also avoiding his wound. Um, and so I thought this was really the great thing and that Marty is the hero because he's the only one who accepts it. You know, he says, okay, yeah, this is how, this is the hand I got dealt. I'm not gonna deny it. And therefore he has access to greater knowledge and greater understanding of those who have been denying it. That's why he is the perfect person to intuit that I think it's this guy. So I thought that was a great way of thinking about it. And I wanted a scene to kind of announce those themes. So I did an improv with uh, the two actors, uh, Gary Busey and Robin Groves, who played uh, Busey's sister and Marty's mom. And we had a big argument and I thought it was great. And I just was kind of, I says, you know, it's like where, where I had Uncle Red says, you treat him like an invalid and you shouldn't do that. And you, you know, and, he, and she says, well, what about your, your, you know, disability? And he's, he's not going to quit. And then she just says, I don't need you showing him how to do it, which I thought just announced in a great way the the theme of the show what that uncle red hasn't confronted his own woundedness it's a powerful and, uh, line i sent it off to steven and he said yeah great do it so he was really really supportive that's awesome yeah yeah i just rewatched it last night and that that is like a really strong scene mm -hmm. that's a great way to announce his problem too mm -hmm. it's a really strong it's i'll say too i'll say one other thing guys that i love too in this idea is the one time Marty gets most vulnerable is when he starts feeling sorry for himself. It's, and it was actually the first scene I filmed. It was my first scene is when he's watching the kids play baseball. Okay. And yeah. he's, you know, sitting in his wheelchair. And, you know, I did these shots of just the legs of the boys running. So you saw that's what Marty's yeah. looking at. You know, they can run, I can't. And he feels, sorry for himself and it's because he feels sorry for himself that he's not attuned to oh my god somebody's following me back. yeah so he lets he gets himself in a dangerous situation by not by not accepting reality you know by wanting to wanting it to be you know thinking by you know complaining about it in some way an inner complaint it's understandable we love this kid and we feel sorry for him but the healthier approach is to say, yes, okay, this happened. And uh, so I thought that was kind of a nice grace note too. That is excellent. Yeah. And uh, do you have any sort of other um, experiences that stand out to you working with Corey Haim? Oh, Corey, and I'm so sad by, of course, what, you know, how his life ended so soon. And, uh, uh, but he was just the most charming winning kid and uh, full of life. And, uh, you know, it was really hard to find this part. We, uh, you know, cast all around the United States and wound up finally having to go to Toronto. Actually, I saw Corey and he, he had a very small part in a Michael Abtet film, I think it was called Firstborn. And I, I liked him in that. And uh, it was great because he just seemed, he wasn't an actor, he was just a kid. And uh, he, he was, uh, he, he was just uh, always eager to learn. I had to actually show, I mean, it's like, you know, I've done a lot of work since then. And I, I was an actor myself originally when I started out. And, you know, uh, working with kids is, can be very different than from working with adults. Working with adults, you really, and I write about all this, by the way, in this book, I hope people might avail themselves of it. It's like, I talk about the importance of respecting actors and, but having a point of view yourself and all that. But you know, with kids, you often have to do things you don't do with adults, which is actually show them how to do something. <laughs> you know, and Corey, his face often, I, I often have to sit with him in, a make, in the makeup room and get, look in the mirror with him. I said, no, no, make this, I don't really feel you're scared. Listen, it's, you know, it's like talk about how, yeah. you know, his eyes had to open more and he had to, you know, uh, and that was very different, of course, from how I worked with anybody else. So the good thing with Corey is he just, um, he really bonded with Gary Busey, who was so much fun, but he was such a handful. And, uh, you know, he was like the biggest kid there was. So it's like, it was, it was funny. I, I, 
I wound up having to spend so much more of my time <laughs> dealing with Gary, you know, not exactly coddling him, but indulging him about it because he was such a big personality. Yeah. And these kids who are just like the ones that you would think you'd be spending more time with were just kind of, okay, then they just kind of followed along. And I'll say something fun too, because the other child actor who was brilliant was Megan Follows, who played Janie. Yeah. And I'm excited because I'm, I'm heading out in a few weeks to Toronto to do a job on a new, new show for uh, uh, Paramount Plus. It's called Rabbit Hole and it's with Kiefer Sullivan. It's kind of a thriller, but I just found out that B <laughs> Megan Follows is gonna be cast in it. So nice. we're gonna reunite for the first yeah, time reunion. since 30, 38 years ago. Well, the first time you've yeah. been everywhere and this is the first time, huh? Yeah, well, we've talked a little bit, but uh, we've never wound up uh, getting, to, getting to do something together. Wow. That'll be cool. Yeah, Enjoy. I'm excited. Yeah. I, so I have a question. Was that um, in Silver Bullet? I heard there might have been a controversy about the werewolf costume. Oh, like, <laughs> do you want to talk about controversy. that? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, it's funny. You know, I, I was a second assistant director on E.T. And Carlo Rambaldi created E.T. So I had worked with him. And, uh, you know, he was riding high after that because it was, this was only two years after E.T. And, uh, but Dino De Laurentiis knew Carlo, they're both Italian. And he wanted, I guess Carlo owed him a favor or something. I don't know what, but he, Dino wanted him to do it like for no money. <laughs> so Carlo had no money to develop this werewolf. And uh, it took, you know, we never, we'd see some drawings and we'd get stuff and, and, and it just wasn't, we, we never saw anything until right up to before we were gonna film. And finally, when it came, it looked to me like a guy in a bear suit. That's just <laughs> all it looked like. And there was, you know, and there was no, uh, very little animatronics in the face. It could move its eyes in a little bit. I mean, you saw everything it could do. That was it in the uh, in the final scene where it gets killed. You know, that was when you saw its close-ups mainly. So my strategy became, you know, like in a lot of horror films, you know, it's like the less is more. So, you know, the less you see it, the more scary you can imagine it is. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it was uh, it was not anything anybody was too happy with. Uh, I will say. What's interesting is we thought it would be uh, someone we had selected to put on the bear suit, uh, but it turned out uh, that Everett McGill, who played the Reverend, was much better at it. So he wound up doing both. So he he both inhabited the werewolf outfit and also was the Reverend. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask if Everett McGill was uh, actually in the costume. Yeah. yeah, he was. Every every single frame of when you see the werewolf moving was Everett McGill. Cool. He actually transformed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Yeah, I think you covered a couple of my questions there. Did I? I cut in on him. <laughs> um. So. Wait, wait. Well, you gotta go back to this one. Oh wait. No, we talked about. Oh, that. we did. We yeah, we were talking. But about cut that. this out of this. <laughs> yep. We got thrown off here. Um, okay, so I got a question. So that was your Silver Bullet was like your only feature film, though, right? Yeah. So yeah. what was your choice behind sticking with TV? Are you ever going to come back to doing feature films? Well, it's funny. Uh, I love Silver Bullet, but I would say I know this is uh, your show treats a lot, you know, deals with a lot of horror films. Horror isn't my first love. I really like characters. I like, I like, uh, you know, uh, reality-based character studies. And I, you know, I, I like it if horror can, can do that. That's what I like. That's like what I was saying about what drew me to the story was this whole idea of, of wounds and how, you know, what makes someone monstrous, you know? Um, so I'm always generally looking for more, I'd say reality-based stories. I, I uh, was offered some horror films after Silver Bullet, none of them had nearly the quality of Silver Bullet. And I was really more interested in finding something, you know, in a different genre. So I, 
I got some development deals and things that, you know, it's called development hell. So, so many things at that time, anyway, we were getting developed that didn't get made. And I was waiting for, you know, my next feature when TV work became available to me. And at that time, people didn't take TV that seriously as an artistic form, but I treated it as well. It's a, it's, it'll be practice for me until the next feature comes along. But, you know, I was, I was, uh, fortunate that kind of something happened, which was called the golden age, the second golden age of television. So I was offered an early episode of The Sopranos. I was offered, you know, and I didn't, I wound up doing that. And, and I started to love the kinds of things that TV was doing, The Wire, Six Feet Under, I did all those shows. And uh, I still was keeping my hand in trying to develop a feature, but um, nothing excited me as much as, as these, and I loved being able to move around. I've been able to do all kinds of different genres. I've done comedy, I've done horror, I've done you know graphic novels, I've done all kinds of things in TV, and it really suits me. I really like the more collapsed time frame, getting to move around more. I do you know read things, and I do keep my hand in it, and I certainly would like to do another feature, but. I got to say, I've gotten very used to this collapsed time frame. I, I love getting to do something, you know, getting it done fairly quickly, and then getting it out and seen by many more people than ever see a feature anyway, and getting to talk about it. So that's that's been kind of my journey. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, he does more of like an episode uh, sort of style. You know, it's it's the development over time. So. Yeah, I, yeah I, I like I like being connecting to some kind of a you know a bigger canvas like you tell like you know, you get into you know explore something over a much longer period of time and then you come in and telling say a chapter of a novel and uh, I like that ongoing narrative. I love features and I would you know uh, it's not that I have a, a determination not to do it. I just I'm very particular about what I want to do and I've I've not found something that that's also found me that wants me to do it that it's been a perfect match so you know it, development is a weird thing and things can take I've been involved with other feature projects uh, that just wound up for whatever reason maybe not going to picture not getting made and and the bread and butter for me has been episodic television and I've grown to love that which is why I wrote the book actually I'll show a picture of it it's uh, called Directing Great Television, Inside TV's New Golden Age. And there's pictures, you know, Claire Danes from Homeland and Dominic West from The Wire and all the Sopranos cast. And, and I, you know, I work on shows that many of your viewers, I'm sure, watch. I've done The Boys. Yeah. Uh, I've done, you know, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, probably not so much for your fan base, but... Uh, you know what, though? Like We've it. seen every single episode. I love oh, good. That. Yeah, I love that show. So. Good, good, good. <laughs> Good. I also did um, a lot of, I was a producer director and did a lot of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, which I imagine. Oh, that one too. People might love. I was yeah, his, involved uh, with the ground floor of that one. His <laughs> podcast is actually, it's um, comedy horror. So you're laughing. Oh, great. You're, you're more laughing than you are being scared. So oh, okay. yeah, it's more like dry humor style, like Shaun of the Dead kind of thing, you know? So yeah. how, how do you guys like uh, the boys? We haven't seen it yet. <laughs> oh, okay. That, you'll, My brother is like the you'll have, I think fan. you have that to look forward to because that's that's definitely right up. It sounds like right up your alley. Yeah. Yeah. And my brother is like the biggest fan of the boys. Uh -huh. And he keeps being like, dude, when are you going to watch it? I'm like, <laughs> yeah. we're trying to get through so it many TV commitment. shows. I want to be committed, you know? Right. And when you put the right. kids to bed at night, you get like an hour or two of oh, TV man. if you're lucky. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. well, so. You're, you're, I'm glad your priorities are right. I'm glad That's, you're, I'm glad you're, we want to be able to just like binge, boom, 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 boom. Yeah. You know, right. So clear right. the, clear the calendar. Right. We're going to do it this summer though. Good. Okay. Next question. Next I, question. I stole your question by accident. It's my fault. <gasps> uh, let's see. Gotta. Oh, yeah. Okay. So you've worked with some of the biggest names on TV, uh, some of the biggest series ever, which we know. What is one of like the funniest, weirdest, most bizarre memories that stick with you on the set of, of anything that you've been part of? <laughs> uh, Probably so many. Oh, but... wow. Uh... <laughs> Well, I mean, I think the most fun 
would be the comedies I've done, you know, because as you just you're kind of laughing most of the, because that's, you know, you try to get into the mental set that is going to encourage everybody else and you want to respond as you imagine the audience does. So, you know, so like it's always sunny. It's just it was a constant laugh. I did a bunch of the show Entourage. That was was a lot of fun. Uh, you know, I was an assistant director, trainee assistant director on Airplane, the movie, which was amazing because, you know, uh, I don't know if people still watch that movie, but it really holds yes, up. I do. And, <laughs> Not uh, just I quote it all the time. <laughs> uh, so, but in terms of bizarre things happening, I, I don't know. There's so many. I mean, there's so many things that are. I mean, it's 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 kind of weird and fun and 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 strange doing sex scenes. You know, it's like where you you know, it's like because it's like the least sexy thing you can imagine experiencing. There's like no, you know, it's like it's all technical and you're doing things over and over and. You know, it's like, you know, but it comes off hopefully when it gets cut together, it's really, you know, exciting. Uh, so that there's some very strange experiences in that. It's like the difference between doing something like that and then how it how it comes off. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know, maybe something else will occur to me. What about like, um, <laughs> what about like one of the locations? Like maybe something strange happened at a location? Well, the amazing thing about film and television is how locations just open themselves up to you to you can go it's like you get the keys to the kingdom it's like they think that i mean where they might have security concerns oh no you're working at your director or teacher oh you guys are doing yeah you should come right into this nuclear facility or whatever, whatever it might be <laughs> is crazy because people you know uh uh just seem to like apply a different standard if they're going to be on television or if uh, you know you're going to try so you know, uh, military, you know, a lot of military stuff. I did some episodes of Homeland where we went to Morocco and, and uh, you know, the, the whole army had to, they have stringent gun, gun control in Morocco. So it's like, you can't, and we had a lot of guns obviously in the show. So the whole military would come and present, you know, have armored cars to take out each piece of, you know, weaponry that had been, you know, imagined before. Um, Gosh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm on the top of my head. I, I, I mean, I just know that it's, uh, this, you know, I've been on, you know, you can get on, I haven't been on nuclear submarines. I know people have done that, but uh, it's just like, you know, you, you get access to uh, incredible things, but I don't know, they're kind of fleeing from my mind at the moment. So, um, <laughs> it's okay. You, you're, you're like, your filmography is like so long. Mm -hmm. I use this line on, on William uh, Ragsdale. I'm like, if we talk about everything you've done, it'd be like a congressional filibuster. We'd be here like all day, you know? Yeah. yeah well. I remember there was someone we were talking to for, was it uh, that went to Chernobyl to film something? Wow. Well, that was um, Jay Cheel. He does a show called Cursed Films for yeah. Shudder. Yeah. 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 I think yeah. I'd, I think I'd prefer to stay out of Chernobyl myself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but for Sometimes at least uh, you know people have a like hundred thousand years yeah. yeah 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 sometimes people have like haunted experiences or they get really creeped out by where they're filming or they have to stay in the house that they're filming in you know i mean you know i saw like i'll talk about the wire you know it's like i don't know if you guys are fans of that show but it it you know takes place in some of the you know truly dangerous neighborhoods in, in uh, baltimore <clears throat> and you know, you go into these areas that, you know, you're dealing with, you know, serious drug problems right there. And, you know, it's like, you know, it's like, so you're, you're, you're trying to create the sense of reality by going into places that are truly dangerous and scary and require a lot of security. Um, you know, so, um, yeah, you take risks, you take risks when you, when you do certain kind of shows. I have a question. I think she told me I shouldn't ask this, but, uh -oh. but I was a huge fan of Sopranos. Yeah. Like, what was it like working? Did you get to work with uh, James Gandolfini? Oh, of course. You can't direct Sopranos without working with James Yeah, Gandolfini. like, how was it working with him? See, well, I mean, I loved, you know, him. I loved working with him. He was <clears throat> very different from Tony Soprano. He's not a thug. Yeah. He's not a violent man. I mean, unfortunately, he's not even here with us anymore. Yeah. But uh, I mean, he did have a temper, you know, all that stuff that he drew upon. I mean, acting is an amazing thing. You, you call upon things that 
all of us have, and you, you, you give vent to them and you let them out to play, but you're very aware. You know, if actors were really truly in touch with that, or, or I think people who will really act out are out of touch with what's inside them. The actors who are in touch with them can control it so that you don't, you know, really hit somebody in the face when you're doing a fight yeah. or you don't when you're getting so angry really choke them to death you have to be in con total control so you got to remember that that when you see actors doing stuff they're probably the most comfortable with those feelings because they have they can they can permit them at the same time that they're totally controlling exactly how they're getting expressed but jim was just uh a mensch he was just a great guy he had demons um I worked on episodes through the first four seasons of the show. Later on, you know, and I, I, I was fortunate that I didn't see any bad behavior, but he did get into some that was never directed at anybody else. He was kind of his own toughest critic. He sometimes went on benders. He sometimes didn't even show up for work very rarely, but there'd be, you know, uh, he, and, he, and he would pay for the day's filming that he had caused. So he was, he was harder on himself than, he, than anybody else than he ever, and he was always just gracious and gentlemanly and uh, a pleasure to be with, and so talented, so uh, yeah. inventive and imaginative. I, I, I love, he's one of the people I most, most enjoyed working with. Yeah, and I mean, he, loves that show and I wasn't saying don't ask it because it's not a great show or great actor it's because it wasn't on brand for our yeah our podcast. but you know what when you're in Rome wait is that the saying <laughs> well I gotta seize the opportunity you know if, like you've worked with someone yeah. or get to work with someone that is like of that caliber I gotta ask the question right yeah you can't, you can't help it it was it was a real privilege yeah plus I'm Sicilian so <laughs> oh. appeals to me all right <laughs> um so i do have i have a question this is gonna be a tough one for you do you still have some time yeah great yeah <laughs> hopefully this won't be too tough i'm trying to think of how maybe i worded this poorly but so i want to seize this opportunity because i know there's people out there doing podcasts like we are and one of our like we do these interviews, but we also do kind of like an audio, like she was saying, like an audio story. Mm -hmm. So it's like a scripted drama. Audio but drama. But you only hear it like through radio. There's no visual. Yeah. So I guess my question is for advice, it's not film, but if you were to take over or start um, an audio drama, like what would you focus on or how would you do it? <laughs> Well, I wouldn't rely on any visuals. How's that? <laughs> yeah, it's tough. It's kind of a tough question. But... Notes. No, I mean, you know, it's interesting. Every project has limitations. Mm -hmm. Every project has certain parameters within which you have to work and tell the story. So you have to figure out how, how, will, how can I communicate my story? And uh, every show has limitations. Every show, for example, television show, they have usually their visual vocabulary, how they, how the, what lensing do they use? What, you know, how cutty is it? Is it something that's gonna be fast cut? Is it something that plays in masters? And you can't really reinvent that when you come to them because it's like, that's the audience's expectation. That's what the show is. So I treat every story I'm telling as, 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 as a world I'm entering and I have to learn its rules so that I can, it's a language I have to learn so I can speak it in my voice. So I'd say when you're doing a, uh, uh, you know, uh, audio play, you're, you're relying on this, right? You're relying on what's coming through and how, so you put yourself in that position. You put yourself, you imagine, this is what I'm doing all the time. It's like, I'm, I'm imagining myself as the audience and then I'm, and I'm watching everything I'm doing or listening and I'm, I'm experiencing it as the audience at the same time that I'm telling the story so that I can know where they are so I can meet them there so I can, you know, assume certain things so that my choices I know have the best chance of affecting them. That's kind of a not very specific way of helping you, but it's like just, you know, what what has to happen auditorially for you for this next moment to land 
you know, what, what, you know, what do you want to happen? What do you want to hear at that moment? What kind of thing is going to occur to you? And it's like, to me, it, so you get rid of the limitation. You just think, okay, what can happen? I can't show a picture of something because that's not going to affect anybody, but how can I, you know, what, what can I kind of, you know, so it's not a specific answer, but it's, uh, it kind of, it's the best I could come up with here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, good advice. Yeah. When I'm editing it, I try to make it seem like you're further away from the microphone or closer, depending yeah. on where you're at. Or uh... yeah, that's kind of how you mix it, right? Or I don't know if that's how you record it, even. But generally, in in film, you try to get the best vocal quality on the on the microphone as possible because you can always adjust that, you know, in post yeah. and yeah. you know when you mix it. Same thing when you're uh, doing a plate to go on a green screen like I imagine you guys are going to have something behind you other than green yeah. that I'm seeing uh, you want that plate generally to be in sharp focus and you can create you can create the sense that it's out of focus if you want to you know like say we're racked to the foreground we're in, we're focusing on your guys faces which means the background isn't going to be in perfect focus because a camera doesn't work that way it only can hold a certain plane you know in focus you know uh, and and at the at the expense of another plane and so but you can adjust all that and it's the same with recording a sound and that's what's fun because you have so, so much at your disposal you can play with something growing fainter maybe or ever more fainter if you want to go into a character's mind you know it's like i'm gonna you know pot up their inner monologue and let the background noise start getting fainter and fainter and fainter because then you're cueing the audience oh now we're really interior mind with this character i mean all those things are things you have at your to play with yeah she does a great job actually editing we use a lot of sound effects and i i always roll my eyes at him because he will write this script and be like okay i made it easy for you this episode only has six sound effects and then he comes in and i've got like 20 lined up i'm like no i need to believe it you know so and then i also tend to take out the longer pauses and then i didn't know if that was if that was yeah, like uh, the beats. because you're not yeah, seeing anything. that yeah that i think you uh that that i have to face every time i'm doing an editing show too because it's like you have to figure out sometimes you can go too far in that direction making things happen too fast because then you don't give room for the emotion to build which sometimes happens in the silences yeah. and the and the very but if you go too long and people are bored well yeah. you've lost them so you don't want that so it's it's again you know the fundamental question i have i write this in my book too it's just like the fundamental directing question for me is how does this make me feel that's all i have that's all you have when you're editing it's like Am I still interested in this? Uh, I am if I bring the voice in here. If I don't, if I let it go a little too long, I've lost the connection between. I don't feel the two characters are really talking. Or if I let it be a little longer, I might create an imagined response in the audience that there's a different subtext the character is thinking by not responding so quickly. Maybe they were thrown by that. Maybe they were surprised. And they need a moment to, you know, you fill in these blanks and that you as the editor get to create them. And the only way you know what's right is asking, well, how do I feel right now? Yeah. How do I feel if it happens here? How do I feel if it happens there? Should it be a little later, a little earlier? That's, yeah. that's, that's the fun. Good. Cool. Yeah, that's good advice. Yeah, yeah, he puts a lot of beats in his script. <laughs> Beat. Yeah. She's always like, stop with the beats. Dramatic man. effect. <laughs> like one time I actually wrote in the script, I'm like, I'm gonna fourth wall the audience and I put a whole bunch of beats and her character's like, stop with the beats. I'm like, just one more beat, okay? <laughs> What's your opinion on fourth walling? Because we we differ on opinion here where I want to be like fully immersed and I don't want to be fourth walled and taken out of it. But then he's the opposite where he likes the fact that the audience is aware that they're watching something else i don't know well are you talking you're talking about something visual now when you take out the fourth one but well both yeah because uh when we're doing the um the podcast you can only hear it but it's based in like my character is based from the late 1800s and then his character is based now in the 1980s and so when he mentions something that's current time that they wouldn't have for that character I'll be like, well, I wouldn't say this about the internet. I don't know what the internet is. And he's like, I'm fourth wall in the audience, for example. 
So, and I'm like, mm, I don't like that. When you say fourth wall in the audience like that, you're saying, you're like, okay, now I'm stepping out and I'm just talking directly to you in the audience who we know you're watching. So we know you know about the internet. So you know I'm an actor that, or yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's a tool. You have to figure out when, you know, when you want to be immersed and when you want to step out and what, 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 what ex I mean, again, that's the question. What experience do you want the audience to have? Mm -hmm. It's like, what's most effective? What's, what story, what story are you telling? That's also a huge question that we have as, uh, as directors. It's like, you know, like what I shared with you about Silver Bullet. I shared with you the story I was telling. I'm telling the story of how do we, how are we, how are we most fully human when we all have wounds? That's the story I was telling in Silver Bullet. You know, how are we most effective or when are we making ourselves uh, endangered and, 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 and vulnerable to, forces that we don't control it's like well you know it's like that's that became my my uh the story i was telling and it informed all the choices so many choices i was making throughout that if another director had come along and never never cared about that theme or never identified it they might have just been telling a different story and they would have told it it would have been experienced completely differently because you wouldn't be getting those those subtle cues even though you're not necessarily conscious that that's what you're following in a deep way, you know that you're following so because it's like your intention gets translated below consciousness often. But you know, it's what makes one story more compelling. I think what's make one one story more compelling than another. So for you guys, it's like you know, figure out what experience you want the audience to have. What where do you want to point them? What story are you pointing them towards? And I think that'll give you answers. Yeah, great. Yeah. That's great advice. Yeah. yeah. A lot for us to argue about. <laughs> good. In a good way, constructive arguments. <laughs> All right. Well, um, so um, I wanted to leave some time to ask uh, for you to share. You've already shared your book, but any other new projects that you're working on that you can tell us about, ones that are coming up? Well, I, you know, I've uh, I just finished a, working on a really cool show. Uh, kind of comedy horror a bit. Uh, it's going to be on Amazon. I don't think it will come out till 2023. It's a new show called The Consultant. And it's a kind of a workplace uh, horror comedy. Uh, and it stars Christoph Waltz, who you may remember, yes. got an Academy Award for Inglorious Bastards. And he was yeah. also in Django Unchained. And it's got two younger actors, uh, Nat Wolf and Brittany O'Grady, and it's okay. it's a lot of fun. It's uh, and it's got horror horror elements definitely to it. It's a story about a uh, tech company, and the young tech wizard gets uh, killed in the first episode. That's not a spoiler alert. That just happens. <laughs> and uh, uh, Christoph Waltz comes in, and it's like this story is like, what would it be like to work for, with the boss from hell? And then you find out maybe he really is from hell so it's uh, awesome. it's, uh, it's pretty cool pretty fun so that one I just did and that'll be coming out soon and uh, uh, you know I'm doing some other shows that haven't even started so uh, and that would be the one I'd approach but I would again put in a plug for my book because I think it's a really fun read not just for would-be directors or storytellers of any kind but just fans for t fans of tv and fans of drama because I share a lot of experiences of just what it's like to sit in the chair, the director's chair. What are the, you know, I, I take you through my experiences and I think it, uh, I think it really makes you, will appreciate more how shows are actually made. Cause you know, we see them and we think of them as though, they, yeah, that's how that show it was. Well, you realize that thousands of choices are go into every moment you're seeing and it can, you know, acquaint you to like, wow, I can see how this is just by, thinking of it this way, change the whole experience. So I offer that to you. And you can find that on Amazon? Amazon, yeah, yeah. Under my name, A-T-T-I-A-S, Dan Adias, or uh, the book's title, Directing Great Television, Inside TV's New Golden Age. Awesome. awesome. I think I saw you could get it at Target too. Is really? That? Yeah, oh, I'm pretty cheap. sure I saw, yeah. Cool. There's also an Audible, I did an Audible too an audible book too so you can get it that way too oh cool, oh, cool. yeah yeah all right um 
Is that for it for that, our questions? I, I just, yeah, I think that's it. I think we covered everything. Um, is there anything else that uh, you wanted to? No, just thank you for uh, reaching out. It's fun to talk about Silver Bullet. It's been over three decades from the time I did it. And uh, I, I still, you know, I still love it. So I appreciate yeah. uh, that you guys wanted to talk about it. Yeah, he loves that it's different than other werewolf movies. Well, it's how, also do you, how do you find it most different? Um, if you're looking at some of those modern werewolf movies, it's like just super gory. But I think what sticks out to me, so I'm an 80s kid. I grew up born in 81. And I have these really fond memories of like the neighborhood, the small town I grew up in. It's being safe, the sunsets, and like riding around on my bicycle with my brother and getting into little adventures. And we were kind of like the outcasts because, you know, I, I was bullied. I wasn't like a popular kid. So Marty kind of like, he kind of hits home with me as a character. And I always had his wild imagination. So we'd be like, oh, what kind of monster adventures can we get into? So to me, that movie really, it, it really resonates with me. Mm -hmm. It's got that cool Stephen King, like it or like Stranger Things vibe. You know, the kids meet some kind of threat and trying to get the grownups to notice or they have to handle it on their own. And that's what I love about that film. Mm -hmm. It's not just a gore fest. Yeah. You get really invested in the characters and I love it. Yeah. Oh, thank you. That's great. I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> cool. That's what I wanted it to be. I mean, I wanted it to be a kid's adventure. And I, I tell you too, one of the odd things about it to me is personally, I wanted it to be a PG-13. I didn't want the gore that was even in there. I wanted to diminish it, but De Laurentiis was sure. Now, anybody who wants to watch Stephen King, it's gotta be a hard R. So he made me go back multiple times and make things more gory, more, more gory, more gory. Cause he just said, you know, so anyway, but I thought it would be a great, just kid's adventure with his wacky fun uncle. Yeah. And, uh, and it's even like, I think actually um, Gary Busey makes a comment. He's like about the Hardy Boys in the film. Yeah. And to yeah. me, it is kind of like a Hardy Boys. It's just really nostalgic. Yeah. The way the movie is presented, it's just a different werewolf film. Yeah. And it's also, as you bring up another, you remind me of another really theme I loved in it too, which is just a brother and a sister, yeah. you know? At, at one point in their lives, they're just, you know, she just hates him. And then she's the narrator. So obviously it's kind of about how they came together and uh, she saw him in a new way. Yeah. yeah. So. Cool. Well, thank you for joining us and for your time. I think we kept you quite a bit longer than I said. In my <laughs> I enjoyed show. it. Thanks a lot. <laughs> I appreciate it.